open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. We are going to jump right into the story. I'm going to read the story in its entirety. It's Matthew chapter 8, verses 28 through 34. And um, it says, When he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come to torture us before the appointed time? What do you want with us? Um, And then verse 30, some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed man. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. And so here you have uh, Jesus, he passes over to the other side of the lake. Where he, where's he coming from? Well, we, we, we remember from last week's message when John preached about calming the storm. So there, he was doing ministry, uh, heals a leper. They cross over to the other side. There's a storm and then finally gets to this land of the, the Gerardines, which was a, a Gentile uh, city. And so this region, they cross over and it, and these two guys come out of the tombs, and they say, what? what? What are you doing here, son of God? Isn't that interesting that these demons are not atheists? They actually know that Jesus is the son of God, but who are demons? We don't talk a lot about demons here at the bridge, but the reality is, is, is there demons, and do demons exist? Of course they do. In fact, we know that when, when uh, Lucifer, he's a fallen angel, right? And so he tries to overtake God and God cast him down. He took a third of the angels with him and these are fallen angels. And so uh, when we know, we know that the devil is not omnipresent. See, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. God is all powerful, all knowing. He's omniscient. He's all, just everything. But the devil is not. And so the devil uses the demons to do his work. And so as we kind of look at the story, we're going to find out a few things about what the role and the functions of demons are. And if you're taking notes, the first function is they they tempt you to sin. See, what demons want to do is they want to, to pull you away and lure you away from God and his will and his plan for your life, and it wants to get you off track. Sometimes people say, well, does God tempt us to sin? No, the Bible says that God never tempts anyone to sin, but the devil does, and he uses demons to do that. It says this, when he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gerardines, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. Listen to this. How did, how did they tempt these guys to sin, and how were they sinning? They were so violent that no one could pass that way. They were so violent that every time somebody walked that way, they got beat up. They got assaulted. They were violent. And if you think about just in America, if you turn on the news, what do you see? Violence all over the place. That's not from God. That's demonic. And so I wonder, though, how did these guys become so violent, right? And I can only imagine that at some point in their life, they were hurt, they were betrayed, they were abandoned, they were disappointed in some way. And as a result of that, they never dealt with that in that life. And so that abandonment and that hurt turned to resentment. And that resentment turned to bitterness. And that bitterness was this deep lying unforgiveness in their hearts that turned into anger that they just can't, they couldn't deal with anymore. And they never dealt with their pain. As a result, they became 
violent. In fact, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says in your anger do not sin, but that if you remain angry and you allow that to kind of carry its course, you know what happens? You give the devil a foothold. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. And, and so what we see is these guys, now their violence and their anger has isolated them from the rest of the population. No one goes around them. And so there they are in their loneliness and their anger and their, just their, their violence. And so that's what the devil does. He, he pulls you away. He tempts you to sin. The second thing is, is demons' desire to inflict suffering on you. The same story, but it was written from the Gospel of Mark's account. So the same particular story, but from Mark's account, Mark chapter 5, verse 5, says that this about one of the guys in the tombs. That night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and he would cut himself with stones. Think about that. The demon would cause this guy to literally cut himself with stones. So this guy was demon possessed. And so demons are spirits and they need to find something uh, like a person to, to come into. And so he, they come into this person and the demon is ca- literally causing the person to cut themselves. Does that sound familiar to America? People cutting themselves? I was in youth ministry for 15 years and I can't tell you how many Young girls that I, I counseled and then encouraged out of, they were cutting themselves co- constantly. Then here's another, uh, another uh, picture of demon possession. Um, there's a, a guy, and he came to Jesus, and he talks about his son in verse 15 of Matthew 17. He says, Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into water. He's literally trying to commit suicide. Where does suicide come from? It doesn't come from God. When people have those suicidal thoughts, oh, you're just, you'd be better off not here. And you start hearing those thoughts, guess what? That's the devil who is planting those thoughts into your head. And so, uh, you know, the, the devil says, oh, there's no hope for you. Nothing's ever going to change. These condemning, accusatory thoughts, those are not from God. They are from the devil. And he's trying to steal, and he's trying to kill, and he's trying to destroy your life, John 10, 10. And that's his role, is he wants to absolutely obliterate your life. Because here's the thing. If you are a a follower of Jesus, and you've put your faith in Jesus and the fact that he died on the cross for you, you now believe in him, you are now God's forever. Like, there's nobody can pluck you out of his hand. Like, you are secure in, in the Father. You're, in, you're secure in God. But here's the thing. If you are now secure in God and the devil has lost you for an eternity, what he wants to do is make you ineffective. And he does that by oppressing Christians, and he does that by... Uh, by harassing Christians. Now, somebody might ask me, like, can a, can a Christian be possessed by the devil? My answer to that is no. Because now, being a believer in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. And so you are now filled with the Holy Spirit. However, as a believer, you better believe you can be harassed and you can be oppressed by a demon who wants to destroy your life. But listen, we have... We have Jesus Christ as our power, and he's the one that ha- and overcomes these things. Number three is, is demons paralyze you with fear. They paralyze you with fear. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us a spear of fear and timidity, but of love, or of power of love and self-discipline. And so what the devil wants to do is paralyze you with fear and with worry, and, 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 and you're so obsessed with what's going to happen to my kids, and what's going to happen to the future, and what if I don't get this job, and, I, and he's just going to totally just start to infiltrate your mind, because that's what the devil does. He gets into your thoughts, 
And he gets you so distracted that you can't even focus on God anymore. And he'll paralyze you with fear. Some of you have experienced overwhelming fear that you don't even know where it comes from. Um, every once in a while, uh, when I am sleeping, I, sometimes I have nightmares. And I don't know why I do, but um, Elissa unfortunately has to listen to them when I wake up in the morning. Like, you had another nightmare? Yeah, you know, I got shot in this nightmare. You know, I just have these nightmares sometimes. And, 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 and every once in a while... I will be kind of half awake, half asleep, and I will feel a presence that is so overwhelmingly fearful that it like causes the, the hair to stand up on my neck. And I'm there, and I, and I can't move, and, and, I, and the only thing I can think of to do in that moment is to cry out the name of Jesus. And when that happens, everything's gone. And Elissa knows when I'm having one of these crazy dreams. This probably happens once a year. It doesn't happen very often. But I'm telling you, and it oftentimes happens when, when God is setting me up for something big, and he's going to do something big, and there's some sort of ministry, and lives are going to be changed. And then it's in those moments that the devil comes and attacks. But, I, but here's the thing. Cry out the name of Jesus and plead the blood of Jesus. Why? Because he's the one that's more powerful than the devil. And so when I call upon his authority and I call upon his power, guess what happens? <sighs> I'm, at, I'm, I'm free. And so here's the deal, you guys. Maybe you've experienced these overwhelming times of fear and dread. And Jesus wants to come in and set you free today. And so from this, from this story... As we were looking at the story, what does the story tell us about Jesus? Well, the first thing it tells us about Jesus is, number one, Jesus has authority over evil. Just like Jesus in the beginning of Matthew chapter 8, he has authority over disease. And then we saw last week that Jesus has authority over nature. Now we see Jesus having authority over evil. The Bible in verse 29, What do you want with us, Son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? So they, they understand their fate. The demons understand that, that, that the final judgment, they will be cast into the lake of burning fire and sulfur in Revelation chapter 20. So when they, they, they ask them, hey, Jesus, have you come to torment them, they, they understand, but they're, they are unwilling to serve God, and they, they follow the devil. Then it says, this is interesting here in verse 30, some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. Now, do you know why? Jesus sent the, the demons into a herd of pigs. Do you want to know the real reason? Because there was no cats there, okay? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Some of you like cats. I'm a dog person. I just offended about half the people in the, in the place. But he, hey, we got one amen, good. I'm just kidding. Cats are our friends too. But listen to this. He said to them, Jesus says to these demons, in fact, uh, in, in another, in another um, gospel, it says that they are legion, meaning there are many demons in this one particular guy. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. So I love the story, though, because Jesus says what? He doesn't argue with the demon. He doesn't get in this back and forth. What does he say? One word, one command, Go. And at that, the demon left. He has a power and authority over demons. Um, you know, guys, I, uh, I have a friend, and he gave me permission to share the story. But for the past two to three years, uh, we, we pray on a regular basis. And he's been diagnosed with schizophrenia. And um, so he, he, he's on medication but there are times when he says to me, Billy, I, I, I believe and I know that there, this, there's more to my sickness than just my mental health. I know that the devil is using this because he plants the most horrific thoughts 
thoughts of murder in it, that he's going to get murdered. Uh, he, he plants thoughts in his head about cursing the Son of God. Like, there's a crazy thoughts. And he goes, I don't want to have these thoughts, Billy. And so he knows that he can call me up at any time. And he, he'll just say, I'm in this time right now, and I've got intrusive thoughts. I've got, these, I've got these voices in my head. And it's those times that I pray these kinds of prayers. God, would you protect over my friend right now? Would you literally remove these thoughts and would you take any demonic activity in his life right now? And I can't tell you how many times he's experienced relief from the name of Jesus being prayed over him in those moments. And so, you know, listen, there might be some here today that, that have some mental health issues and, and sometimes they're just mental health issues and they're not demons, right? Right? But I oftentimes think that demons can, can use and capitalize on our weaknesses. He can take, you know, maybe that unforgiveness in our heart. Or he can take that depression and that anxiety that we have been going through. And he, he'll, he'll take and he'll use that and he'll come in in our weakness and our vulnerability. And that's when we need the power of Jesus in our life to be able to overcome and to be able to experience freedom from, the, from these things. The second thing that I want to share with you guys uh, about what this says about Jesus in this story is this. Jesus cares deeply for those who are suffering. I love the fact that Jesus crosses over to the other side of the lake. Now, it's important for you to understand that Jesus is Jewish. His disciples are Jewish. And what he does is he goes to a, a group of people, and there's, there's racial tension between the Jews and those that lived in the Gadarenes. And what does he do? He goes over, and so he's interacting with, first of all, Gentiles. But second of all, these guys are not only Gentiles, but they're living in the tombs. That if anybody in the Jewish culture came in contact that with somebody from like a dead body, they were considered unclean. And so Jesus comes to these guys, and, they're, and they have a demon, or they've got demons inside of them. And what it tells me about Jesus is that he is so loving and he cares so much and has so much compassion that he will cross over no matter what situation and he will, he will enter into your brokenness. He will enter into your addiction. He's not afraid of, of the demons in your, in your heart, in your life. He's, he's not afraid of that. In fact, he has the power. And what does he do? He goes because he, because he cares. He loves you more than you could ever imagine. And I'm just going to tell you right now, we are a church that we get together and we pray and we ask God, would you bring those that are brokenhearted? Would you bring those that are, are just, they're, they're, they're struggling with life and they've got issues and they're suicidal? God, bring those people. Why? Because we know that Jesus alone has the power to rescue them. And so Jesus cares deeply for those who are suffering Another, and, the, and another thing that I want to share with you from this story is that um, you can't serve both Jesus and money. That's what the Bible says here. It says, those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. This is incredibly sad. Can you imagine this? This guy gets healed. These two guys get healed for being possessed by a demon. They're the, in another gospel, it says they're in their right mind. He brought them back to their right minds. They're not cutting themselves. They're not suicidal anymore. They're not violent and hurting people. They're like, they're, they're calm. They're at peace. And that's what, that's what happens when Jesus enters into somebody's life. And so they see this. But what they see is that Jesus has messed with their economics. Jesus has messed with their, their, their wallet. And as a result of that, they go, no, no, no. We don't want anything to do with Jesus because he's messed with our money. And, and can you, how sad is that? One of the saddest stories in the Bible that these guys, instead of saying, Jesus, come into our town, come into our village, We've got other people that are broken and hurting and need healing and need forgiveness and need help. Come on in. Do what you're going to do. We'll give up pleasure. We'll give up, we'll give up fame. We'll give up money. It doesn't matter. We just want you, Jesus. And they didn't do that. They cast him away and said, Jesus, we don't want. And Jesus answered their prayer. 
unbelievably sad. But here's the thing, it's, it's, it's important for us to be able to be willing to give everything up for Jesus. Sometimes we just have to give up the things that we think we need. And, and, and maybe the devil's even deceived us into thinking we need these particular things over Jesus. That's what he'll do, he'll say, well, you, you still need this, you still need this. No, you need Jesus. And unfortunately, they didn't realize that um, they needed him. In fact, Matthew, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and be enslaved to money. And so what an important lesson. Um, what I wanted to do is I want to give you some as we start to kind of close the message out here, I want to give you some very practical advice in regards to this message on evil and demons and the devil. Uh, the first thing is this. Don't treat the enemy lightly. You have an enemy of your soul, and he's trying to destroy your soul. He's trying to keep you from a relationship with God. Don't, don't take it lightly. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities and principalities of this dark and evil world. Like, there's this, there's this unseen world, guys. And right now, and it's not, you have to understand something. It's not like, like the devil's over here and God's over here and they're doing this tug of war and it's a back and forth and we don't know who's going to win. Here's the reality. Is that God is, I've read to the end of the book and I know, God wins. God is victorious. It's not like he's, you know, he's still in control. He's still sovereign. He's still God. And so we don't have to, to be afraid of the devil. But like I said, the devil will, will try to remind you of your past. And that's one of the big things that he does. He says, you know what? Uh, you, know, you know what you did. You, you call yourself a Christian. You know what you've done. That accusat you know, accusatory condemnation. That's what he wants to do. He wants to trip you up and he wants to re remind you of your past. But here's the thing. If you are in Jesus Christ, Jesus died on the cross and sacrificed his life in your place so that you can experience forgiveness so that your past is wiped clean and you are no longer bound by your past. You are now bound. You're like filled with the Holy Spirit and you live in freedom. And so the next time that the devil wants to remind you of your past, remind him of his future. That Revelation 20, right? Like, hey, you want to remind me of my past? Well, I'm going to remind you of my, your future. You're going to hell, and you're going to suffer there. And so, so don't take it lightly. Don't take it lightly. The second thing is this. Don't flirt with darkness. And this is what I mean, is that many people in our culture, we have a lot of people that are, quote, spiritual in our culture, right? And, and, and they, they consult mediums and they, they consult tarot cards and they have these different things and they're, they're very spiritual. You know what that's doing? It's opening yourself up for demonic activity is what you're doing. That what you're doing, you're messing with Ouija boards and different things. In fact, Deuteronomy says this. Um, Deuteronomy 18 verses uh, 10 through 20. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. And so, guys, we're not, we're not rubbing crystals together. We're not trying to create se seances. Like we're, we don't do that kind of stuff. We don't read horoscopes as Christians. I can't believe how many Christians, I'm like, like what, you know, what's your horoscope? And what are you, you know, I'm reading, I'm like, what are you talking about, man? I'm reading the Bible. <laughs> I'm reading the truth of the word of God. Why? And I only tell you this because you're opening yourself up to evil when you start doing these things. And so the Bible's very clear about this. Um, and, then, and then here's the cool thing. Fight the devil, not in your own power, but with God's power. And how did Jesus do it when he was, he was led into the wilderness? He was tempted by the devil. And what did the devil do with Jesus? He went after his identity. He, would, he, he said this, if you are the son of God, 
then you can take this, these stones and turn them into bread. And, and, and Satan actually twists and used scripture. But Jesus used scripture within context. He says, well, yeah, but he says, you know, uh, God does, or a man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes out of God's mouth. Like, we need God's word. And so three times the devil comes to, say, uh, to Jesus and says, um, if you are the son of God, he goes after Jesus' identity. And Jesus, what, how does he realize his identity and what he's going to do? He goes back to the word of God. And he believes and he trusts in the word of God and God. And so what I want you to do is you got to learn scriptures, know scripture, bask in it, understand it, be able to in those moments when God plants a certain thing in your head, a certain lie in your head, you, 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 what do you need to do? You take that lie out of your head and you insert the scriptures into your head. That's what I do with my friend. When we start, when he's talking about how bad he feels and all these different things and the condemnation he feels, I'm asking God that he would replace all of those negative thoughts with thoughts, thoughts about how God loves him, how God is powerful, how there's hope in God. And so, um, so fight with scripture, you guys. And then know this, is that Matthew 10, 1 says, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. And so, greater is he that is in me, 1 John 4, 4, than he that is in the world. Greater is God that lives inside of me, so I don't have to live in fear. And, and also, that I have this authority that he has given me. It's not an authority that comes from me, but it's an authority that he's given me to be able to, to pray for people, to see healing take place and lives change, and to be able even to cast out demons. And so this is, this is a powerful message. We don't talk a lot about that here, this here at the bridge, but we need to talk about it more, I think, because it's here and it's real and we see the effects of the evil one on our world and, and even the effects of the evil one on the, the suffering that we see in our children. And so maybe you're here today right now and you're saying, you know what, uh, I don't think I have a relationship with Jesus and I don't think he could ever touch the, the broken parts of my life. That Jesus really, he, he can't touch that addiction in my life. I'm just hopeless and it's always gonna be that way. Maybe for you right now, you're, you're just filled with bitterness and rage and anger and you don't know how to control it. I don't know what it is in your life right now that you feel so much shame and guilt about. Can I just tell you right now, Jesus crosses over to the other side of the lake and he comes to you and he comes to your heart and he says, I can touch those things. I can set you free. And I, and I love the fact that these guys, they come out of the tomb and they come into life. And right now, I just feel like some of you are gonna, you, you're dead inside. Some of you have experienced this death and maybe not a physical death, but in your spirit, you just feel dead inside. Today is the day that you move from the tomb into a relationship with God into life. And that's what God, Jesus does. He brings life to the lifeless. And that's what he did to these guys. And he wants to do the same in your heart as well. And so let's pray and let's ask God right now to just bring life into our hearts. Father, thank you for your love. And thank you, God, for the fact that, Jesus, you have the power to set people free. And right now, Lord, if there's anybody in here that is bound by a demon... If there's anyone in here right now, Lord, that is overwhelmed and, and feeling so hopeless about life and can't get out of it, can't crawl themselves out of this hole, that right now in the name of Jesus, you would set people free. Lord, from their addiction, from their shame, from their guilt, from some of these things, Lord, that they've been carrying around for years, God, I pray you would set them free. I pray right now also for those that maybe they, they don't have a relationship with you. They've never come into a relationship with you, Jesus, that right now in your love and in your power, God, you're calling them into a relationship that they can just say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you were resurrected on the third day and that you demonstrated power over sin and death, God, when you 
were raised from the grave. Thank you, Jesus. And I believe in you and I receive you into my life. Jesus, thank you for anybody that has prayed that prayer and just in their heart said yes to you, Lord, that right now, God, they, they have the Holy Spirit. They've got your power. Lord, they've got your, your, just your forgiveness and your love in their life, Lord. I pray that you would continue to do a healing work and a sanctifying work in each of their lives, Lord. We thank you for this day and thank you for your deliverance. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.